So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture at the um, IWM. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome <coughs> Alessandro Monsuti, who is uh, a colleague of mine at the Graduate Institute. Uh, he's a professor um, at the Department of Social Anthropology and uh, Sociology and um, is an associate researcher at the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford as well. He has had a long and distinguished academic career. I'm not going to go into all the different um, um, stations, but just to mention he's been a research fellow both at the University Yale University, a grantee of the MacArthur Foundation, and a research fellow at the School of African and Oriental Studies. He's also worked as a consultant, um, and I think that probably will be part of the material which we'll go into the talk today. He's worked as a consultant for several NGOs and international organizations, including the UNHCR. The two publications I'd like to mention is his book on war and migration, social networks and economic strategies of the Hazaras of Afghanistan, both in French and in English, and uh, most recently, Homo Iterans. This is a global ethnography of Afghanistan, published already in French, coming out th next month in uh, English. Alexandro is no stranger to Vienna. Uh, he, I think, had a uh, visiting uh, professorship at the uh, Department of um, uh, Social Anthropology here, and he's coming back to the department again very soon. But he's also no stranger to the IWM. He um, was a visitor here in, I think, 2015, when we invited him to give a political saloon on Afghan refugees in Europe. And I remember how different the atmosphere here was. There was no breathing space, 80 of us in the library, and we had a really animated discussion. So under these circumstances, these are very changed circumstances, but I'm so happy he's back as a fellow at the IWM. And thank you very much for those of you who are with us here today physically, and of course, those of you who are attending the talk online. Alexandra Bunsuti is a scholar of migration, especially of diasporic networks, Afghan diasporic networks, which he has been studying intensively since the mid-1990s, not only uh, in Pakistan and Iran, of course, he has done many, many decades of fieldwork in Afghanistan itself, but he has also studied the Afghan diaspora in India, in Europe, and the US. He has focused on the modes of solidarity among uh, these um, uh, Afghans uh, forced to migrate a country devastated by civil war in hundreds of thousands, millions by now, and their networks of cooperation, which are mobilized in this situation of armed conflict. He has also analyzed subsequently not only the war, but also post-conflict reconstruction in Afghanistan, the strategies developed by the refugees and the migrants in a shrinking but unequal world. Among his current research interests are not only humanitarianism, because that is what uh, he brings um, with him from the uh, long years of fieldwork experience in Afghanistan, but also a larger um, uh, interest in larger questions of political economy of reconstruction in post-conflict situations, and a focus on fuzzy sovereignties which emerge in such contexts along with the new modes of global governance through international institutions, NGOs, and uh, others working on the ground. He also has an interesting study mm, uh, project actually funded by the Swiss National Foundation studying the uh, complex relationships in Geneva itself among various communities of migrants and the relationships between migrants and non-migrants. He's looking at um, uh, these in very particular urban neighborhoods. So it's a study, if you like, not only of migration, but also of urban anthropology. And um, his most recent inquiry is into the changing nature of borderlands in Europe and South Asia, particularly northern Italy. And uh, he is also engaged in a filmmaking project in that context. So let me give you the word, Alexandro, to present uh, um, 
your latest book and then have an opportunity to discuss that with you and then I hope we are able to see the film next week soon. Thanks very much for being here. Oh, actually, I should, I should introduce <coughs> Aisha as well, not leave her to introduce herself. So, uh, Alexandra's um, uh, discussant is my colleague uh, Aisha Chala, my colleague in two senses. She's a fellow anthropologist and a fellow sociologist, um, and uh, is professor of um, social anthropology at the University of Vienna. And she's also a colleague in the sense that she is a permanent fellow at the IWM, where she runs our uh, uh, project together with her Indian partners on forced migration and which involves the building of a uh, uh, Europe-Asia platform on this topic of forced migration. So we could not have had a better discussant for Alexandro's talk. It's okay? Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Let me first thank the organizer of my, my, uh, my coming here. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to have been introduced by you. Uh, you will see, you will recognize probably sometimes during my talk some bits of our discussions. So I owe you a lot and it's uh, always a pleasure to be back to Vienna and uh, I, I'm very thankful that you keep inviting me. And uh, let me also greet, obviously, my, uh, my discussant, uh, Aishi Chahla, who is also someone I'm very honored to have as my, my discussant, because I read her for years before having met her, but uh, I'm lucky enough to have met her some years ago, and uh, it's a privilege to have these running discussions. Uh, before starting my, uh, my formal talk, I would like also to mention another colleague, our French-Iranian colleague, Fariba Delha, who is, as may maybe some of you uh, know, uh, jailed, imprisoned in Iran since uh, June 2019. So she's a dear friend of mine, and uh, I would like to mention her and to have a, a small thought. Uh, we think about her, and we hope to have her around very soon. You know, in some context, being an academic is indeed risky. Uh, so as a preamble, let me possibly say a few words on my conception of anthropology. So uh, I would, if I would been asked in a cafe what anthropology means for me, I would say basically two things. First, it's about questioning categories. It's about taking nothing as obvious, what people consider to be something which should not be questioned, that's exactly when anthropologists arrive, and we'll say, oh, if it's not questionable by you, it's probably because there is something to be questioned. So that's why I think anthropologists are not good partners in a family. So no, don't marry an anthropologist because they will make your life miserable, I think, because everything, nothing is obvious, everything is questioned. Uh, but obviously this, this uh, I would say, endeavor, this questioning of categories, go through uh, a concern for the everyday life for the everyday. And here, in my conception, the quality of the relationship we are capable to develop when we are doing our job as anthropologists is the quality of the material we are producing. So I found myself ex extremely difficult to imagine working with people I dislike. Uh, obviously, maybe I can say as a principle that I don't dislike anybody, but uh, for me, the quality of the relationship is part of the job and is the, the, the criteria, almost, of the quality of the material. Uh, as m uh, more you have a good qu a relationship with people, more they will tell you things that you have not asked. And uh, a piece of material that has been not been asked is normally of better quality than a response to a question. So that's very, very important for me. Uh, let me also say that we are all, I was here four or five years ago in this room, we were almost 100, now we are hardly 15. We don't know, we are going through hard times with uh, COVID-19, and uh, you are 
uh, wearing masks. I'm freed for a time just because I'm talking. And I was thinking the other day because I'm working with uh, an artist uh, making masks in Italy. So he's doing masks, uh, wooden masks, uh, carnival masks. So carnival masks are masks supposed to mock the powerful. They are subversive. Let's think also to the, to the Islamic veil. Uh, covering your face is considered to be a sign of alienness. And suddenly the mask is changing value and is becoming uh, a, a tool of control and it's becoming a tool of health and it's obviously on the, size of, on the side of order. So uh, as an anthropologist, for, for instance, I'm puzzled by this change of value of the mask in, in, in today's world. And uh, okay, maybe we should start uncovering ourselves, I don't know, but uh, that's something which I found quite interesting to see how in the name of security we accept increasingly to see our fundamental freedom and rights suspended. A second uh, introductory remark, because I'm in the book actually, even if it's not ap apparent. Uh, you have seen this horrendous killing of a professor a few days ago in France. I'm following the debate. That's obviously a, a, an act which is not uh, acceptable. But I was also a little bit surprised by the response by, uh, from the authority, the French authority, a kind of ritualistic appeal to the universal values of the Lumière. So no thinking about the national history, Franco-French history of subversion against the state. Let's think about the Commune de Paris in 1871. Absolutely no thinking about colonialism and post-colonialism. So it was just a kind of uh, rehearsal of the universalistic value that French, France uh, has brought to the, to the world. And uh, that's, my book is in a sense about that. My book obviously doesn't talk about Islam in France and doesn't talk about carnival masks and uh, sanitary masks. It talks about Afghanistan. But Afghanistan uh, considered in a global way. So I'm trying to put together uh, a concern for the reconstruction of Afghanistan with uh, a focus on global circulations. I will uh, talk a lot about that, but uh, the underlying concern is for power, sovereignty, the state, inequality, subversion, resistance. Uh, I would like to dare to, uh, to uh, wound your ears with my poor German. Uh, and just because I, I, the book opened with a, a quotation by Bertolt Brecht uh, that I would like to, to read, and I would dare to read it in German. It's from the poet, uh, poem written in 1939, not by case, and die Nachgeborenen, so for the people who are not yet born. So, gingen wir doch öfter als die Schuhe, die Länder wechselnd, durch die Kriege der Klassen verzweifelt, wenn da nur Unrecht war und keine Empörung. So Brecht is complaining that there is injustice everywhere and no indignation. And I think uh, these lines, obviously written in a very different political and historical context, are probably still very valid today. And they, are, uh, they have been a source of moral inspiration for me when I was writing this book. Okay, so I take Afghanistan to talk about something more than Afghanistan in a very uh, um, double way. I will go back to that. So Afghanistan for me, it's a signifier of global dynamics. So I'm very ambitious on one side because I take Afghanistan as an entry point to understand and to study or to explore things which I consider to be global. But I do it in a very modest way uh, adopting a warm, warm eye view. Uh, that's why uh, I decided to write the book at the first person. It's I. It's not I, I, I. It's I because I'm talking about what I witnessed, the things I have seen. And then I'm trying to uh, share with my readers uh, first-hand vignettes, scenes I have seen in very different contexts, and from these vignettes, these little stories of everyday life, I'm trying to get up to a higher level of generality without normally making explicit my references. So I, I quote very little. Uh, I just try to be inspired by the literature I have read. I quote them often, but not in a very explicit way to bring these small stories from everyday life 
to uh, something more significant, more broadly. Uh, so I have, I have indeed, now I'm forgetting my uh, PowerPoint. Where is the remote control? So for me, Afghanistan is really a very interesting case study to study global things. Myself, I have been lucky enough to, to meet very different categories of people. Afghan refugees, obviously, Afghan uh, civil servants, villagers, American soldiers, Italian UN officers, uh, Swiss students, French humanitarian workers. So I have worked uh, with many, many categories of people and I considered all of them as interlocutors. It's not like some were my object of study, the Afghans, and non-Afghans were maybe interlocutors in another sense, no. For me, a, a US general was as much a source of information for my, my job, for my, my work, than an Afghan refugee met in a refugee camp in Pakistan. Uh, and myself, during these years, many years, I have uh, myself been in very, very different positions. I have been a PhD student, wandering around Afghanistan. I have been uh, a UN consultant. I have been a teacher in Afghanistan. I have taught for uh, an, uh, think tanks to Afghan researchers. I have been an activist at the UN. I have been a friend invited to a wedding. I have been uh, a friend invited at home. Uh, so I have been myself uh, uh, a wanderer. And I have not only talked with many people with different uh, status, but myself, during my own work, I had very different statuses, from which I have gained a lot for my insight about this global ethnography of Afghanistan. So a double multiplicity, if you want. So uh, uh, let me also say that uh, initially I wanted to write a totally different book. So I didn't write the book I, I was planning first. I was planning first to write a classical monograph on a reconstruction re, uh, project funded by the World Bank called the National Solidarity Project, which is part of the book. I, I, I have worked on it, but it didn't, I wanted to do really a monograph on that at the village level. And then I thought, no, let me open up. I have worked in more than 20 countries with Afghans. So why don't you uh, make, capitalize on that? And I have shifted away from my initial project. Uh, um, so my argument, uh, my goal was to integrate into a single paradigm, a single problematization, the reconstruction of the Afghan sta state, the post-2001 uh, you know, reconstruction of Afghanistan, with uh, global circulations. But global circulations, not only of Afghans, but also of experts, military, and about myself. Myself, I was circulating from country to country in a much more free way than many, many Afghans I was interviewing. So uh, these two concerns on the reconstruction and migration, to put it like that, were al always doubled with uh, a strong reflexive thought on myself and my discipline thinking who I am in this world, what's my legitimacy to say something, but also what anthropology as a discipline can tell us that other disciplines maybe could not tell us about a place like Afghanistan. So the methodological and reflexive movements was always intermingled with my narrative. So my overall question, if sh I should try to summarize it, was what the Afghan situation, what Afghanistan conceived as a global place, what practices and discourses triggered by the Afghanistan crisis is telling us about today's world? Very ambitious question, very ambitious question. But obviously, that's the kind of questions asked by children. So I thought I was ambitious, but I was, I was, I was also at the same time very childish. And I think it was refreshing to be childish sometimes, asking big questions, even if you know you will never have the capacity to answer them. But some questions are needed to be asked even if we don't have any answer. Uh, it was a a absolutely a clear stance against what I call the WWW literature on Afghanistan. By WWW, I, I mean what went wrong. You have libraries, shelves, explaining us 
which mistakes have been done in Afghanistan after Timor, Alaska, after Rwanda, after Vietnam, and so on and so forth. So I was clearly against this literature because uh, this literature is based on the idea that some mistakes have been done, and it clearly they have been done in the reconstruction of Afghanistan, but if we would have avoided these mistakes, the situation would be much better. And I think what is going on in Afghanistan is about structure. It has to be understood as structure features and not as an accidental you know, event. So I thought we, would, we need to go beyond the literature on mistakes done in Afghanistan to look at something which is more in the substance of the world. So my two main arguments was first, uh, the international community here understood as the US Army, the United Nations, all the, the plurality of NGOs around the, the United Nations, including Afghan uh, NGOs, have failed to convince large segments of the Afghan population that their model of society and state was good. So it's what I would call the story of a failed hegemony. So many Afghans don't believe that what they have been served after 20, uh, 2001 is such a good model of society. The second, uh, the second thesis, uh, argument, I would say, is that uh, uh, it's more related to mobility, migration. I don't like to talk to my, of migration. Uh, I will maybe explain you why. So the, the second, I, um, I completely forget about my PowerPoint. So the first concern was the reconstruction of Afghanistan, fade hegemony. The second one was more on the global circulation, not only of Afghans. I insist on that. So for me, uh, mobility, circulations, are a, a way to map global power relations. We are almost all mobile, and people who are not mobile are still concerned by mobility, but in a different way. So uh, tell me how you are mobile, and I will tell you who you are on the ladder of global power. And myself, I had to be reflexive on my own mobility. Uh, how I can go to Afghanistan applying very easily to an Afghan uh, visa compared to how an Afghan will be able to come to Austria or to Switzerland. So mobility, yes, we are all mobile, but not in a flat world. In a very vertical world structured by inequalities and power. So that's why I needed to invent my own language. That's why I was not happy with uh, the usual dichotomies in migration studies, refugees against migrant, forced migration against voluntary migration. I needed to escape from this vocabulary and that's why I propose homo itinerance, itinerancy. I wanted to have a term which had a poetic dimension because I think uh, Afghans very often say traveling is life uh, so I, uh, I thought itinerancy, itinerant, homo itinerance, had this poetic dimension, even if I'm totally aware that very often the way they travel is extremely painful. Okay, so that's, um, that's, uh, that's the, the framework. My two main arguments about the failure of hegemony has embedded in the reconstruction process and uh, mobility, global mobility, as a way of mapping uh, power relations worldwide. Uh, now, uh, you, you, I'm living in Birgitta now, uh, District 20. It's impossible for me to go out in the streets without hearing uh, people speaking in Dari, the Afghan Persian, or in Pashto. So I can really feel more than in other cities, I must say, the Afghan presence. Uh, uh, what is quite interesting if, is, is that uh, Afghanist Afghans in the last few years have been maybe the second group of asylum uh, seekers in Europe after Syrians. But if you look at 20, 25 years, it's the biggest one. Uh, and it's still a country at war. If you look at the Global Peace Index, Afghanistan has the, the, the very sad privilege to have been always, and it's the only country which has been always since the, P, the GPI exists, 2008, uh, ranked among the five less peaceful places in the world. And uh, last, uh, since last year, it's again number one, after having lost this sad uh, position to Syria since 2011. 
So Afghanistan is still at war. At the same time, uh, I want to, uh, let me go back to that later on. I, I want to, to jump on, on. At the same time, the number, the, the proportion of um, uh, asylum granted is much lower than uh, other populations. So if you look at the famous year 2015, Afghans were second after Syrians, but they were only fourth or fifth in terms of asylum. Uh, uh, they were, yeah, they were only fourth in terms of asylum granted. Why? Because obviously the countries which are the European countries granting asylum are also the donors of the reconstruction. So accepting the fact that Afghanistan is still at war is just recognizing publicly the failure of what they are doing in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan are somehow misrecognized as refugee claimant in Europe for that reason. Okay, but uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, once again, I'm sorry, it doesn't work very well, probably. Uh, but I think it's extremely important for me to indeed escape from usual dichotomies between forced and voluntary migration. So I think it's important to reframe also what's going on in Afghanistan and elsewhere into global re uh, relations of inequality. So I don't want to go into detail, but you have many, many uh, studies showing that we are probably today, in spite of the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we are probably living in the most unequal world ever in human history. Uh, you, 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 we can just look at uh, Oxfam uh, annual report on world economy. You have these figures, figures which are quite surprising. 1% of the humanity is owning as the rest. 9, 1%, 99%. But only eight people, eight people, half of the people in this room are owning like 50% of the world. So that's something which has never been the case in, in, in history, in the past, and it's every year it's even getting more than that. So we have also to understand that these migrations, these, these, these migration flows are in uh, such a landscape of inequality. Uh, that's for me extremely important. That's uh, for instance uh, uh, a board in Calais, the Calais jungle, I will go back. So fact the border, uh, fact privilege, etc., cetera, et cetera. I, I'm not the author of these, uh, these, these slogans, but uh, I have some sympathy for them, let's say like that. <laughs> So uh, you can see on the, on the ground, inequality is present in the mind of many people uh, labeled as refugees. And finally, in Afghanistan, you have also the uh, demographic dimension, but time is running, so I will not uh, explain you more than that. Now I would like to possibly to just zoom in uh, the Europe route. I will not talk about Australia, I will not talk about the US or Canada, I will not talk about Afghanistan so much, maybe in the Q&As. I would like to, to focus on the, the, on the Europe route, the land route from Pakistan and, and Afghanistan to Iran, uh, Turkey and the Balkans. How much time do I have? Probably I don't have any time left. I will try to be a little bit faster. So uh, let me uh, explain my strategy as a narrative strategy and also argument uh, with three vignettes. First, Lesbos. Lesbos, you all know, it's a Greek island just in front of Turkey. 11 kilometers, if I remember, far away from the, Turk the Turkish coast. So I was there early 2015 at the very beginning of the, the crisis, it was not big, big, big like later during the year, but uh, I was here uh, uh, actually commissioned by UNHCR, so I was a UN guy, and I had access to places that normally I don't have access to as a, a simple anthropologist, including uh, welcoming centers, detention centers, how you want to call them. And uh, let me just show you the two gentlemen on the, on the left. So let's call them Reza and Mohsin, two young uh, Afghans, Hazaras, who grew up in Iran. 
and uh, I was able to talk to them, and they just arrived in the morning to Greece, to Lesbos, after having crossed the sea at night. People who had never seen the sea before that night. Uh, I can tell you, also in Australia, uh, I, have, I have heard stories about the terror that sea represents for Afghans. They didn't know that there was so much water in the world. They didn't know that water can form waves, so mountains. Uh, someone in Australia told me if I have to go back to an, a Taliban jail or back to a boat, I would prefer the Taliban jail. Just to show you the level of trauma that it was to cross sea at night. But they were covered by mud. And I started to talk with them. Oh, where are you from? And uh, I had been to the place where they were from. They hadn't been because they grew up in Iran. But I was able to, to tell them about the valley. I, ha I had my computer. I turn off my computer and show them uh, photographs of their place of origin. And they started telling me, tell us, tell us, it's not Europe here. It's not Europe. Ah, no, no, it's not Europe here. Tell us. So they could not make sense that their dreamed Europe was treating them in such a way. So that's the first vignette. For me, uh, they were in a kind of um, protective or defensive denial. It's as if their ideal of a destination that, were, that was the place where they wanted, they dreamed to build their life was not, you know, was escaping their, their hands. I know, okay, Greece is not really Europe, no. When we will reach Germany, it will be different. But they were in this defensive denial. The second photograph is in Patras, in some factories where, abandoned factories where young Afghans, sometimes 11 year old, are hiding you know, at night when they try to, um, to go on boats going to Italy. So second vignette, it's Friuli, a region I know quite well. So it's the northeast of Italy. It's the entry point to Italy after the Balkan route. Uh, so it's very close to the Slovenian and Austri Austrian border. And here I discovered in the village where my father is from, uh, two hotels were full of Afghans. 70 Afghans and Pakistanis uh, actually uh, um, accommodated by the Red, Red Cross, Italian Red Cross. I started to get acquainted with them. And once I brought all, uh, as much people I could put in my car with my two kids, and we went to a festival in the mountain in an abandoned village. Uh, we were totally uh, ignored by my friends, but Mr. Akmal, you can see him, uh, he, the whole evening we were talking and he was staring at my son, that's my son, and finally he, he, he took my son in his arms and he asked his friend Gulara, Take me a photograph. Uh, Alessandro's son is the same age as my son that I have not seen for four years. I would like to send a photograph of Alessandro's son to my wife. And when I brought them back to the, the hotel, here, you behave like an Afghan. Which I thought was a strong compliment, but was not a compliment for fellows around us. So after the denial, the defensive denial, it could not be Europe. Akmal has discovered that it was indeed Europe. And he dared a moral judgment on how Afghans behave like how Europeans behave. Third vignette, and the last one, it's obviously the infamous Kale Jungle. So I went in Calais, in the jungle of Calais. I am sure that all of you have read many accounts in the news. The very day of the, the very evening of the terrorist attack in Paris. I was in Paris in the day, and I was in Calais at night. And during the night, you had a big fire in the camp, and many people were wondering if it was a retaliation after the attack in Paris by some uh, right-wing groups. So I spent a few days in the jungle, and uh, I discovered Mr. Essanula, who was running a restaurant. That, uh, it was windy, it was November, if you remember, November 2015. It was super windy, rainy, cold, and uh, obviously the restaurant was under tarpaulin. It was not, you know, everything was really uh, makeshift, a makeshift uh, camp. And uh, this Mr. Essanula, he had an Italian idea. 
delivered for foreigners. Italy is delivering these ideas to get rid of the people so they can travel in Schengen area. But I asked him, why don't you stay in, uh, in Italy? You, you have a document, you can open a small shop near a, a train station in Padova. Say, no, here I sleep in a tent, that's true. It's cold and windy, but I have my own business. I have my own business and I'm among my peers. So after the defensive denial and uh, moral judgment, I, I find his attitude as going back to action but an action which has abandoned the wish or the, the hope to integrate into the surrounding society. And I like to use an expression coined by uh, an Italian philosopher, Paolo Virno, engaged withdrawal. So they are withdrawing, but in an engaged way, because it's not passive withdrawal. It's a kind of reinvestment into action, but among themselves. So there is a kind of moral migration from Lesbos to Friuli and Calais that illustrates my two arguments. First, there is a failed hegemony. Afghans, and here I'm talking about Afghans in Europe, are not convinced that what we, was served to them was such a good model of society. And second, uh, they are mobile. They are mobile I mean, in a very, very difficult way. Uh, mob mobility at high cost and often traumatic and the trauma is not only uh, in the war in the country of origin, it's on the route, and it's in the so-called destination countries. So now I would like to, uh, to give the floor to uh, Afghans, and that will, will be my conclusion, so I don't want to steal conclusion, uh, to steal the words to uh, other people. I think they deserve to be listened. And uh, that's uh, a passage I found uh, with my colleague Khadija Abbasi, we translated it together uh, on Facebook. And uh, Khadija Abbasi has done her PhD. She uh, herself uh, is an Afghan who was born uh, in Iran. She's a, a so-called Irani Gak, a small Iranian. That's how other Afghans are calling them. In, uh, in Iran, they are called uh, Afghani uh, with uh, bad words following the term. You know that Afghani doesn't exist as a term in Afghanistan. Afghani is only the, the currency. But uh, when they go home, they are called Irani Gak. And many of the people here are Irani Gak, people who scattered later on in the whole world. So there are you, Afghan youth scattered between Australia, Europe, North America. Uh, and uh, this dialogue uh, goes across gender barrier. And uh, I think it's quite a powerful dialogue, and that will be my last words. So let me just read uh, this exchange. Zari, a female Afghan who had just applied for asylum in Germany, defines herself on her Facebook page by using the term awaragi, which may be translated as wandering, I translate it as itinerancy. And awara, wanderer, itinerant. That's the figure of homo itinerans. In a sense, homo itinerans is a translation of awara. Awaragi, she writes, Zari, means being born in Tehran, expelled to Kabul, and finding myself in Berlin, but nowhere do you live your life. She's probably a young Afghan born as a refugee in Iran. That little sentence elicits a number of responses. Shafika, just arrived in Australia, writes, remain an awara. There is death in immobility. There is death in immobility. Wandering in, is in our generation's blood. Just imagine, in three decades, we have experienced enough misfortunes for three centuries. Zari, during these three decades, three generations have become wanderers, and a fourth is taken to the road. We are homeless, suspended without an identity. Suraya, a young woman living in the United States, joined in. Dear Zari, there's no life beyond that. Ashmat contributes to the discussion. We should carry our identity under our arm when we set off. For the walls of our, here there is a mistranslation, for the walls of our home are putrid, and we wander in streets that do not warmly welcome us. Afghanistan on one side, the West on the other. Zari, these streets do not warmly welcome us, and these putrid walls do not bear our identity. Hashmat, these putrid walls have crumbled Thousands and thousands of the missing will come up from the soil. Kind of 
end of the war, you know, figure, metaphor. Munira, I was born in Kabul. I asked for asylum in Hamburg, but that's only the beginning of my story. Next, I was tossed to Norway and had to start all over again. I was tossed to England and had to start all over again. I was tossed to Scotland and had to start all over again. And maybe I'll soon be tossed somewhere else. Maybe life is nothing but that, endless uprooting. Sadiq, we are a wandering generation. Wandering, it's always Hawara, Hawaragi. Shafika, a wandering generation, always in between two moves. Even if we were no longer tossed from country to country, the simple fact that our minds are rootless would be enough to stop us remaining in one place. Even in the country that grants us asylum, there is death in immobility. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> Cup of tea? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just move there too. Oh, yeah, that I like talking and standing. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, of course, I had the chance of to see parts of the uh, parts of her, uh, his book, and um, I think I mean really thanks a lot for this kind of the um, fascinating glimpse that you provide us to the ethnography of the, uh, how to see, how to look, approach the kind of the um, post-conflict uh, reconstruction that you refer to. If you want that it is, uh, maybe I could move like this. Let me just take, if I need to take some notes. Oh, okay. Okay, and I think that uh, what you show uh, in a very skillful way uh, <laughs> and address the question of the who are the actors and the sites of the uh, reconstruction of Afghanistan and make it clear that if we were to constrain ourselves within the territorial boundaries and the sovereignty, so you were referring to those terms that the power, sovereignty, and then resistance, but that they were all uh, embedded in it. So I would like to pick them out that which they are in, the, uh, in your writing. So if we were to remain our, uh, our ethnographic analysis within the boundaries of the territorial boundaries and the corresponding kind of the uh, sovereignty and the encasement of the people, we would not have been able to understand what was going on. That is the neither the failed um, hegemony nor that the kind of the uh, uh, making and then remaking of the uh, of, of Afghanistan. And actually, I think, on the contrary, you show, and uh, from those kind of the vignettes and then the where you were showing the, the maps, that uh, it is a it is a transnational and a multiscalar field that where you uh, show that uh, how and and within that how in the seemingly independent places actors institutions are very intimately connected uh, to each other and uh, in as such Although you started with the kind of the methods question, but remained very much in the kind of the what the anthropologists do. But I think in that way it goes very much to the uh, heart of the um, debates of methods in ethnography in terms of the uh, spatial and temporal scales. Uh, the parameters of actually uh, ethnographic uh, analysis. And what I like is that uh, in, uh, in the work is that instead of also long tirades about the methods and the, the theories and discussions about that, actually you simply show how it is done. So how it is uh, this kind of a global ethnography that you referred to that uh, 
uh, could be uh, could be done. So I think it is a uh, in that sense. I think it is uh, a very um, impressive. Uh, the work. But nevertheless, I will try to pick up, and I think I have a couple of questions uh, that I would like to uh, ask, and uh, maybe we could open up the kind of the uh, discussion. First of all, uh, it's about the category of the itinerants that the itinerants, or I, I have a problem in terms of the uh, pronouncing it. I fully understand your dis uh, dissatisfaction uh, with this kind of uh, futile efforts to differentiate the refugees, the migrants, through a kind of a grid of platter of legal categories, bureaucratic and administrative uh, categories, and uh, or disentangled the forced and the voluntary migration. And yes, they do impoverish our uh, debates. And not only that, they actually they hinder us to understand the social phenomenon that we are uh, confronted with it, and then uh, they dominate the debates and the politics and then uh, policies uh, about that. So uh, then, and also I understand very much that which are very much in um, built into it uh, in your discussions that in uh, um, trying to stand against reducing mobility to simply a situation of insecurity or economic uh, hardship, trying to see a kind of an agency and then the, also the uh, motives and the ambitions involved in that. So the kind of the, the person that in Calais could move but does not move uh, to back to Italy, that they has some kind of other plans and other kinds of uh, uh, ambitions. And so rightly so that you suggest this category of that itinerance uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of the other categories that we operate and you very much like the anthropologist then saying that okay we should not be using those kind of the categories questioning those kind of categories as you have uh, started so but what I understand from the, the itinerants uh, is that they refer to a very uh, this very uh, a variety of mobile uh, people, and somehow that is a kind of the category that you would like to put forward in terms of that uh, for analyzing, for understanding this kind of the global circulation and then the, the mobility. And they use the uh, mobility as a tactic as a strategy to diversification of routes, uh, destinations, risks, and alliances, economic activity, to cope with the all kinds of insecurities. So it seems that the mobility is, as you said, that is the common uh, den denominator of all uh, of the people that you put in the category of the itinerants. And I'm asking here, my question is that what is the, uh, why not to use the category of my mixed migration? which uh, is very much actually uh, is a product of this kind of unease uh, dealing with this kind of the uh, uh, differentiations of disentangling uh, voluntary and forced migrants, which includes all sorts of kinds of displaced, uh, displaced people, but it does not put all the kind of the mobile people who are embedded in very different kinds of power hierarchies together in a way collapsing. I'm just skewing, uh, skewing it. So what does the category of itinerant make visible which otherwise remains invisible if we were to use the category of mixed migration? 
the second question is about the mobility. You said that you want to bring that the mobility, which is central to your argument, and you say that it is an analytical key. And I'm wondering, how does it serve as an analytical lens uh, here? Um, because uh, I'm asking this in relation to um, uh, in relation to power. That because you said that the power is very important for the kind of the analyzing the uh, mobility uh, routes, uh, circulation, and the uh, mobility uh, networks. But you refer to very different modes of mobility. Uh, the mobility of refugees, the UN officials, civil servants, academics, researchers, returning expats. So uh, how do these, and these are all embedded in different institutional networks of power. So how do different modes of mobility and power relate to each other? So, uh, and if we do not make the, uh, without making these relations and their variations, uh, mobility uh, might have the danger of uh, be remaining as the common denominator rather than an analytical key uh, in understanding uh, uh, this uh, process. And coming back to the category of the itinerant, I wondered whether this is a descriptive or analytical category. Because with all the people it entails, ranging from Afrikani migrants, refugees around the world, expatriates moving from one crisis to another, researchers moving between camps and uh, UN offices, um, it might be a descriptive category. So if this is so, is it unique to Afghanistan? Uh, or could we, for example, talk about a similar kind of category of itiner uh, itinerance in different parts of the world? Uh, for example, do we see anything, something like this, coming out in relation to Syria? Did we see similar kind of things, for example, in relation to uh, post-conflict uh, or re uh, reconstructing, post-conflict reconstruction of the other places, for example, in Bosnia? Did we see that kind of uh, category emerging? And if it, is, if it were an empirical category, then question that I would like to ask is what contributes to the emergence of uh, this kind of a category of uh, itinerance? So uh, then if it is not a descriptive, but an analytical category, then aren't we bringing too many very different kinds of groups of people embedded with very different power hierarchies together? So we could do it, but uh, uh, we might be curtailing some, something uh, else. And there, I think, I will start that I liked uh, what you uh, talk about at the very end in terms of the, what the global, um, what the re um, Afghani refugees uh, use to, uh, in different parts of the world, to refer to themselves with this avare. Uh, I don't, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrongly, but... Uh, Okay, so it is, uh, but I think it is the similar word in Hindu, I think, that is the, the uh, avare. And, and I think that this is, this term, we could use it as a kind of an entry to see that what kind of detentions that we are talking about, a kind of a category of the uh, itinerance, because, yes, uh, avare means um, wanderer, being without home and uh, entailing a kind of uprootedness, vagabond, but also it means being idle and without work and without uh, actually uh, proper uh, work. In that sense, uh, do avare is a designation uh, very applicable 
to the refugees who are on the move, who have to be on the move, and without home, who are left and made idle, and who are in uh, waiting. But I'm not sure whether Avare would be applicable to the uh, other people that are part of that the category of the uh, itiner, um, the itinerant. Definitely the researcher, the civil servant, the expat are not the avares in the same way as the uh, refugees are. So I wonder about the analytical use of such a kind of a heterogeneous uh, category defined basically on the basis of access of mobility. And uh, the third point I would like to raise is uh, about the um, itinerant um, acts of resistance that you, uh, you did not talk about it very uh, much here, but you mentioned in terms of this active engage, um, what is, um, uh, engaged with role, engaged with role, and about their subversive potential you refer to, which I find it very important and I think is crucial. And is the subversion that you see uh, you're talking about is a kind of an act of defying laws or judicial and bureaucratic orders? So in a way, act of defying themselves, defining themselves and acting against the existing dominant forms of relations and mobility and governance. So if we are talking about the agency there, are we talking about challenging the relations of their governmentality and the resistance mechanisms or tactics or are we talking about of emergence of spaces, what is referred in the literature as the autonomy of uh, migration, within which the, the migrant, the refugee, in your case the itinerant, becomes a political subject. That is to say that it becomes, they become actors in politics. And if so, where do we see them becoming actors? And uh, autonomy is about also essentially about power, then what kind of power do we see in terms of those kinds of engaged with role and acts of resistance that you refer? And finally, I think I will make a kind of a suggestion of a different entry point uh, to what you describe under Afghani itinerance, mode of behavior and strategy in terms of their spatial mobility, um, political fluidity or socioeconomic plasticity that you uh, talk about. I'm asking could we situate the itinerancy in close relationship to their, these people's encounters with the kind of frontier-like border policies, especially of Europe and borders within Europe. Because this is the itinerary, the, the basic quality is the kind of the flexibility and that the plasticity that you are uh, talking about. And, um, uh, being able to uh, uh, move around, diversify, and uh, different strategies. The way the, the borders, why I'm saying this is that the way the borders operate uh, have close affinities with the colonial border and frontier policies whose main characteristics were their flexible management and governance of population groups by ensuring very differential access and rights by means of graduated and overlapping forms of sovereignty that Shalini was also referring to that kind of the fuzzy uh, sovereignties, but in this time there's it's the uh, overlapping forms. And once we look at the borders within and of Europe, what we see is a kind of a proliferation of laws 
ever-changing regulations, categories, governmental techniques, and administrative practices that shape the refugees' rights to uh, refugees' rights and livelihoods, ranging from their asylum application to getting food and water. So there is a kind of a really uh, uh, a broad uh, zone for that, very flexible. And furthermore, these access to rights uh, vary very much in relation to the exact physical location of the refugee at that moment or and or rescue uh, time, whether at sea or on an island or in a mainland or you are at a camp, or you are at a hot spot, or you are at the front of a, a gate, you might be coming from the... And you actually, on top of that, you uh, bring the cat, uh, variations uh, with gender, and in terms of gender, age, and supposed homeland. As you referred, many of them are in Iran, but they, once they are counted as that and they would be sent back, they will not be sent back to some of them to Iran, but they will be sent back to Afghanistan. So that they, those kind of homelands make a big difference in terms of that their chances and their uh, uh, livelihoods. And within the context of these border regimes, I think, and technologies and those kind of uh, variegated, these policies of governance, there is no other way for the forced migrants but to act as homo itinerants in order to be able to survive and navigate their way through the, those frontiers, I think. So I think this is what you're telling us is not the case only for the Afghanis but also for the uh, same, but also those like for the Syrians, for the Iraqis or Eritreans, who find themselves entangled in these kinds of border and governance uh, uh, regimes. So that the, this kind of the homo itinerance, in a way, might be a kind of a product or came out in that kind of encounters. And maybe they, the itinerant refugees you vividly describe are the product of the frontier policies of today's post-colonial world. So maybe we might have that kind of an uh, entry point. So I think I have posed uh, some questions, and these are the starting points for the uh, discussions. But thanks a lot for, uh, for a very uh, profound way of showing how could you do a global ethnography. Thanks. Uh, do you have, uh, may I respond or? Quickly, yes. because I yes. think that's uh, very substantial. So uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much. That's extremely inspiring. Uh, let's say uh, first, maybe to have a trans transversal reaction. Uh, you put the finger on a problem I have because on one side, I want to show that we are not mobile in the same way. Mm -hmm. The heterogeneity of mobilities and mobile people on a scale of power. And on the, on the other side, I want to unify the field yeah. of mobility. So, uh, so that's, that's exactly, I think, you put the finger on that. So how can you, at the same time, be analytical to, uh, to, to, to show that mobility is somehow related to many, many ways of being humans, but at the same time, we are, we are not mobile in the same way, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to analyze why and how people are not mobile in the same way. So. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, I have no strong theoretical pretension with the term uh, homo itinerance, itinerancy. Uh, I used it here. Uh, that's not something, uh, that's not in my working program to make it as an analytical concept. But uh, your, your question remains, uh, what's the analytical dimension? So, uh, uh, but first, maybe the very first question on mixed migration 
Uh, my understanding of mixed migration, at least in its history, is that it was used by uh, states and uh, uh, humanitarian ag agencies when people they consider refugees and people they don't consider as refugees are following the same uh, routes. And, uh, and, uh, 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 and that's something, I, I, indeed, I, I didn't want to fall into. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, for me, it was starting from the principle that people are actually categorically, in the term of categories, distinct, but following the same routes. And that's exactly what I wanted to avoid. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not very happy with the term mixed migration. And it's not something I wanted, also because in itinerancy and homo itinerance, I wanted to include also the mobility of uh, US soldiers. You know, for instance, when I was in Ghazni, central Afghanistan, I was visiting uh, a US barrack because I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to interview people from the provincial reconstruction team, so the, the military doing development. And uh, the two young American soldiers who searched me they were from one from Minnesota, the other one from Iowa, and the two of them, they told me that's the first time we get out of the States. And they were terrorized. They, and they, they, they asked me, but you, how is it that uh, these people, they don't seem to like us? <laughs> so they were also itinerants, in my view. Obviously, they were also vulnerable in a sense, no? But differently than, uh, than Afghans, you know, crossing the borders in the Balkans. So I have this uh, contradiction that I have not solved. How can we unify it while analytically make distinctions between, not categories, mm -hmm. but between uh, what I want to, 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 uh, to reveal, power relations. Uh, to, to make it short, I don't have the, an the answer, let's say mm -hmm. like that. But uh, uh, I tend to think that uh, for me, itinerance, itinerancy, itinerant, homo itinerant, was more um, a way to, sh to uh, I don't think it was, in my view, uh, a, a, a label supposed to become an analytical tool. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would pretend it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was more like a, a almost a metaphorical way of saying that sedentariness is not the normal way of living for a human. Okay. To, to answer, you know, by the, the reverse, and that's something, obviously, uh, I know that you agree. Uh, I like to quote, uh, I didn't quote it, but the opening quote of the first uh, chapter is uh, uh, Hazara Farmer, I met in Bamiyan. Mm -hmm. I ask him, where are you from? And he answers, I'm from where I, I, I go. So I, I, I'm from God, I came from God, I go to God, so traveling is the, human condition. So in a sense, I would like to have this kind of epistemological and moral displacement mm -hmm. and to consider mobility, whatever we want to call it here, as more normal than the absence of mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, 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 uh, I'm totally aware that I'm uh, circling around your question without addressing it uh, uh, directly. So analytically, so what would be the terms of my analysis? Mm. So that's, I think, the question you ask, which is an extremely important question. And uh, uh, I have to think very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would probably jump to the last one in order to, under, to, mm. to, uh, to, to, to answer that one. For the subversive potential of mm. mobility. Uh, Indeed, sometimes they play the role they have to play in order to get access to some services. And I, I'm, I'm fully in agreement with your point that uh, uh, it's in the encounter with border policy that they are transformed and become somehow paradoxically uh, itinerants. Mm. But uh, uh, they have, you know, the, the, the three uh, vignettes I, I shared with you, they have a very explicit subversive uh, discourse. Mm. And uh, now I have a PhD student, uh, uh, Sarah Bittel, who is working among Afghans in uh, Greece and Berlin, and she's working on the strategies of visibilization by Afghans, Afghan artists in particular, of their struggle, you know, in terms of administrative access to, etc., etc. 
And uh, you can see that uh, you have writers, photographers, they are extremely well organized, they have Facebook pages, YouTube. So uh, they have developed, they are developing explicit strategies using a whole series of tools to, uh, to become political actors. Uh, and art is very important. And uh, because here in Vienna you have such uh, incredible, I would say, uh, uh, density uh, network of museum. I'm going to many museums. And sometimes I thought, uh, looking at Museum of Contemporary Art or Modern Art, that probably the most creative contemporary art is outside museum now. And uh, we should look at migrants and refugees because uh, they, use, they use images, they use uh, video clips, they use internet in an extremely, I would say, acute and aggressive way, in a sense, and uh, uh, to become and to constitute themselves as political subjects. At the same time, I think the figure of the migrant, and probably even more so the figure of the refugee, is a political subject beyond his or her own will. Mm -hmm. Because he is a political subject in terms of discourses that are articulated on his or her, you know, circulation. Like maybe uh, during the French Revolution, the political subject per excellence was the citizen. Uh, we need to, to form citizens, and that was a positive political figure in order to create a new society. Now the migrant, the refugees, it's amazing to see how much it's at the core of almost every single political debate in Europe and North America. So I think even beyond the explicit intentions of the people I have met that you are meeting and we are meeting, they are political uh, figures, they are political actors, yeah. because their presence and their circulation is shaking the structure of our society. Even if they do, that's not, first of all, their intention, and even if sometimes that might be their intention. So for me, uh, uh, they are really, uh, it's a political subject. The migrant is a political subject by himself and herself and by all the discourses surrounding uh, him or her. Um, so for the, the encounter with border policies, uh, I, um, I, uh, I fully agree with you. It's probably not an aspect I have, uh, I have deepened in the book, but uh, uh, I can only, uh, I can only um, uh, follow you and accept your, your point. Uh, uh, once again, I, I would like only to say it again that for me the homo itinerance was including myself, was including the US general, and it's not only the category of, uh, of, uh, of the Hawara, and you're right, I said Hawara, in fact, homo itinerance is just a translation of Hawara, it's wrong, you're right, uh, because Hawara is much more uh, deprived of rights, no, it's someone who is a vagabond mm -hmm. and has probably some means to respond, but uh, if for me, the homo itinerance is also the powerful. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to, to imply, and I didn't talk about the powerful here today, tonight, but in the book, there is something on the powerful too. So the Hawara is not the powerful, mm -hmm. clearly not. Indeed, uh, is the one who is homeless, uh, jobless, and mm -hmm. is, is uh, in Persian, there is this expression, dar badar, it's mm -hmm. door to door. So he's, he's literally living under bridges now, and uh, so, uh, so it's a much more uh, focused uh, category. But um, now I'm working mostly on the border between, uh, as you, uh, Shalini has mentioned, Italy and former Yugoslavia. But actually I left this book uh, when I wanted to, st my next idea was to look at uh, exactly, I think, what you are saying, what makes an act a political act? Uh, when something which is not intended to be political is still political through its consequences on the surrounding system of, uh, you know, equilibrium and these kind of things. And uh, I think here we, once again, uh, that's something I had in, in the intention to do, but I didn't do. I do it through PhD students and uh, 
uh, people who are working on uh, uh, the digital media, on uh, art among migrants in Berlin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think we have to uh, to reinvent our conception of what makes uh, of political mobilization, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think we lack, at least in my knowledge, we lack theory, good theory about what political mobilization here. I have heard sometimes people telling me when I was presenting the, the rationale of the book, yeah, but uh, you know, a, a political act, you need a vanguard, you need an alliance, you know, the Marxist discourse, an alliance between different social classes, you, have to, you need to reach out, etc., etc. All things I consider very valid, but still, uh, I believe we have to look differently uh, to politics today uh, to consider what makes someone a political actor, what makes a category of political subject, and what makes an act and political act. So I'm still not working on that, let's say like that. Maybe there are some other questions from the, uh, from the audience and then also maybe from those ones from the online, I don't know whether Thank you a lot for your talk. Uh, but I wanted rather to ask a question on a different point that you mentioned about a failed hegemony. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, for Gramsci, hegemony has a very distinctive social and historical specificity on, on it because like not a universally applicable form of governance, but that emerged at particular point and with particular stakes. So I wanted to ask you then, how we can think about how hegemony is reconfigured as a notion when uh, in application to the case y uh, you are referring to, to Afghanistan, why it is useful to think in terms of hegemony, of attempted hegemony, because we are dealing with situation of I external, yes, in many ways, governance of a very particular mm -hmm. situation on the ground. So whether it's a new configuration how we think about hegemony in this new context, why, why it is applicable, and maybe also how even the actions of these uh, international institutions or international agents, how they are informed uh, with this notion uh, of government that is premised on uh, what we associate with hegemony. I mean, as a government, not through violence, yes, what is first, that it's through mm -hmm. consent, which is always not complete, but uh, government not, not through violence, which I think in case of Afghanistan uh, is uh, like uh, requires certain probably development. Thank you. Should I answer or take more questions? That, because that's a, good, that's a big one, so mm -hmm. probably I can, uh, yeah. if you don't mind, uh, I, I would like to, to react immediately. Sure, no? Sure. no, because that's, that's a very, uh, um, important question. Uh, once again, in the book, I don't develop these discussions. That was not my way of writing. But it doesn't mean that your question is not relevant. On the contrary, uh, you will never hear, hear, you know, in the among UN people, people talking about hegemony. Either in New York, Geneva, or Kabul, they talk about uh, winning hearts and minds. They talk about the rule of law. And they talk about empowering the people who are on the right side of history among Afghans. So that's, that, and, and, and you, I can tell you uh, among UN people working on, among Afghanistan, on, uh, among Afghans and in Afghanistan, the dominant narrative is that we are in front of a fight between modernity and tradition. So they deny the fact that the Taliban, to put it like that, are in modernity. They are resisting to modernity. Uh, so they think we have to look at new Afghanistan, old Afghanistan, and empower people representing new Afghanistan, and empower them in the sense that they have to become like the organic, if you want, intellectuals, capable to convince a broader and over broader Afghan segments of the population of the benefit of the model of state and society we are offering them. So that's the kind of discourse uh, we hear. Uh, so I don't think most of them have uh, read uh, uh, Gramsci, and hegemony is certainly not a, uh, a, a term you will hear. But if you look at uh, the way they conceive their endeavor 
in Afghanistan and the horizon of the reconstruction effort, it's really about you know, convincing people that uh, our values are good for them. And for me, that's not so far, obviously the context of uh, the analysis, the Gramscian analysis is very different, but I don't think this idea transposed to a different context is totally, totally alien to uh, what, let's say, Marxist philosophy was proposing. Uh, so the vocabulary is different, but uh, uh, my point was that they failed, uh, I think uh, it's very clear, they failed to uh, convince large segments of the population and they failed to make sense of this failure. So they fail to make sense of this failure because the response is people who are not convinced are just uh, leaning towards an archaic conception of society. They are resisting against. And they don't recognize in particular, I would say, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Taliban courts are more successful than government courts even for people who are not supporting the Taliban. They are faster considered to be fairer and cheaper. So uh, that's something most people who are active in the reconstruction and here specifically to the reconstruction of the judicial system are somehow blocked to understand. And uh, so they, 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 they cannot move to the, to the, the idea that um, uh, the idiom of the, the, their action is not accepted as legitimate by uh, large segments of the population. Uh, thank you so much for, for this lecture. Uh, and uh, well, this is really a uh, powerful uh, figure, uh, homo itinerans, and I'm still uh, wondering, uh, um, didn't you, you think that, uh, that it should be maybe appropriate to relate to the figure of, you know, endless uh, traveler or endless uh, wanderer that uh, appeared like uh, three or four decades uh, ago and it was somehow est uh, related to this, you know, idea of uh, postmodern uh, condition and this feeling that the world has changed and kind of uh, Hyper, hyper modern era came and we are all free to travel and it changes uh, the, the whole you know uh, uh, basis of uh, social uh, sciences and I just wonder just d d do you do you feel that you should hum somehow relate to the to this concept with a kind of bitter criticism and yeah. with uh, recognizing to what ex I mean how it was possible because th the world doesn't change as much. I mean, the, the forced migrations and the kind of uh, displacement, displacements always happen, just, just happen to also, uh, just that this is the, this is the history. So how, how it was possible and, uh, and th that this kind of concept uh, may just uh, spread around the world. It was, it was really powerful metaphor that was coined at that time. And this concept is something opposing this and is really profound and really, so, so this would be the question. Don't you think that, that uh, this is something tempting to, to respond to, to these theories which had at the same time big impact on the social science theories and on the other hand were completely blind to certain experiences of uh, displacement, displacements and migrations, etc. And the, the second question would be um, about uh, about uh, so if, if if there is any 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 feature any of of uh, nomadic uh, experiences of post nomadic societies embedded in these uh, stories that you that you that you told us. I mean, in a sense that uh, well, I've heard from 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 uh, from herders that basically we heard that it was in Mongolia don't like to move. I mean, that, uh, that, that movement, migration with, with animals is something that they, that they do not consider as a, as a sort of, of, uh, uh, of th this long journey, the living their homeland, living their place that they live. 
At the same time, I know very well that these uh, societies, uh, this kind of communi these communities, developed mastery in uh, moving, in uh, in uh, traveling, in uh, uh, developing networks of long distance care, of long distance help. At the same time, it, it is something that is very much based uh, and rooted in this kind of uh, nomadic skills. So, is it something uh, in common? in these experiences uh, that you mm, that you described here. Yeah. Uh, also, in, in a sense, you know, on relying on networks uh, uh, consisting of brothers, sisters, and the kind of uh, constant swap and, and uh, constant relying on, on peers, on brothers or sisters. This is something that I, that I know well as a kind of this long distance help and this long distance care. Okay. Should we collect some? Yeah. Uh, I, I have seen, if you don't mind, there is someone from Kabul who is uh, asking to have the right to, to ask a question. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, just okay. I don't know whether to pose this question or not because um, so my I, um, my Latin is not good. Is itinerance is it a verb or a noun? Would be my question. And why I ask this question is because you started off saying first of all thank you so much for for the lecture both of you actually I, I learned a lot a lot really about um, about the field and also about your subject matter and uh, too, too many things that we can discuss later that you mentioned during the talk that are really very helpful. But I was um, going back to where you started off saying as, you know, what do we do as anthropologists? We critique categories this is, or, or problematize categories. And, um, and what I um, liked about the word um, hawaragi is um, that it is about activity rather than an identity. So, so it's mm -hmm. so... Would it be interesting to follow this this uh, uh, this line of um, or the potentiality of such wordings that are uh, more doings rather than beings mm -hmm. uh, analytically, so as analytical tools, mm -hmm. as concept mm -hmm. to address this whole problem of identity? Because indeed, what do borders do? They produce. Uh, uh, criminals, they produce illegal persons, they produce uh, legitimate uh, travelers, they produce categories of people that are hierarchically ordered. So um, would it be interesting to think um, along doings and activities and how we are constantly being performed as this or the other rather than looking for uh, the, the perfect identities or the labels to work with? Okay, I have three questions. Mm -hmm. What should I do? Sure. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know in which order I should take them. Probably I will uh, take by uh, the, the middle one, the second uh, uh, question by Tomex, because it's probably the easier. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm always a little bit sensitive when people are talking about migrants in terms of nomadism. Mm -hmm. Nomadism, uh, is, uh, etymologically speaking, means pastoral, pastoralist. And many migrants of today are not mobile because they are pastures now, pasture people. And uh, uh, Hazaras, they are, for instance, uh, many of my interlocutors were not Hazaras. Hazara, they are sedentary farmer, mountain farmer. Obviously, they have a past of, they have a memory of being nomad, but uh, nomadism is about displacement, you know, along known routes. And you have the same, st at least, uh, uh, in, in the place I know, in Afghanistan, they go from the upland in summer to the lowland in winter. They are trading as much as having, you know, animals. And uh, normally they go all the time. That's something which has been described in the, in the let's say, Tur Turco-Persian world. Uh, they are following the specific routes. Each time, each 7th of February, they will go to, uh, to, to spend time with the f the, a specific farmer with whom maybe they are intermarrying. So uh, they have, you know, representative in the sedentary population. One brother is making politics in the city. Another one is making bread in Dubai. And the third one is, great, is, great, is having the, the, the sheep. And uh, 
So I, I think it's, it's, I think we should really keep distant uh, nomadies from uh, migration in, in that world. And I, I, I hate when I hear things like uh, the nomads of today. I think it's, it's not an inspiring comparison because the mobility are totally according to different, I would say, principles. Uh, when mobility, do you say nomads, they don't like being mobile. We have seen in the last uh, Facebook quote how contested was the, uh, mobility. Mm -hmm. There is death in, in, mob in mobility, so there is beauty in mobility, but this beauty comes with a very high cost. And I could show you also rap songs from Afghan rap, you know, uh, where the, you, here you have also a quote against our elderly who don't recognize us at home. The walls of our home is putrid because our elderly, they don't recognize our right for autonomy, our quest for autonomy. So leaving home is also a way to get access to some form of autonomy, but by God, that's tough. So uh, it's, it's a relationship you can see in this quote of love and hatred to mobility. Uh, but okay, the first one, uh, you know, uh, I'm also very, very much uh, uh, allergic to uh, statements like, we are living in an unprecedented age of mobility and migration. That's not true. Look at the 19th century. The 19th century has totally reshaped uh, human, uh, human repartition worldwide. Colonialism, look at South America, North America, Siberia, Australia, South Africa, and many, many other places. Here, colonial empires were running the show and telling to everybody where they had to go. It has totally transformed the world. Uh, slavery, coolies from India, South Asia, China, uh, when slavery was done, we started to import uh, South Asian and Chinese workers. You go to places like, uh, I don't know, Mauritius, uh, La Réunion, two neighbor, nearby islands. They have been populated totally differently, but from outside, by colonial states. So uh, look at that period and today. Today, we are talking about 2.5% of the, the, the European population. Uh, 150 years ago, we were talking about 100% of the population at continental level. So uh, indeed, I think uh, these, these, these mobility circulations have little to do with the kind of postmodern you know, uh, condition. I think we have to be very uh, careful about uh, singing the praise of mobility from our planes mm -hmm. and saying that uh, it's something which never in the past humankind have experienced. That's just blatantly wrong. But that's not, that was not your question, but uh, I'm just insist on that. So we have also to replace uh, the scales of what we are studying into a long history and be aware of continuities and ruptures, but certainly the rupture is not in the scale of mobility today. Mm -hmm. it, we have to be very careful here. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, your, your question, okay, uh, Hamada, I, I read your text on uh, Haraga, so I uh, I, I see very well uh, uh, your suggestion, uh, and obviously I, I like it. I like it very much. I think the term awara awaragi has probably here analytical potential because it's also a term which is negative by some aspects, but is used in a way which can be valorizing. Uh, I would like to quote, for instance, a rap, uh, a rap uh, song by uh, a gentleman who is now in, in Canada. Uh, Habib et Taimouri, and the title is Hoviyat, which means identity. And he's starting, you know, by a, a classical Hazara singer mocking Iranigak. They pronounce Persian like Iranians. They say noon and not noun for bread and so on and so forth. And then he's starting, yes, I pronounce Persian like an Iranian because I have been grown in Iran, but it's written on my bones that I'm Afghan. And he said, and I'm, I, I was kicked away from Iran, and if my father and my grandfather had treated me like that, who I am, what can I do? I'm betrayed from, you know, at home, and if I'm betrayed at home, who I am? I'm a Hawara. So he, he, somehow it's very tough, so he, he's saying, okay, I'm a Hawara, not so much uh, at the, because Iranians or, or Austrians or Swiss or Greeks, I'm a Hawara because you, my father, 
my mother and my, my family who are not recognizing me uh, and my quest for autonomy. So uh, there is also something I have not, uh, if I would have time, that's what I would like to study now empirically, is uh, it's the youth and how the youth is, uh, uh, is, is really squeezed uh, between many, many constraints and uh, feels very often unrecognized by its own, you know, let's say the, the ancestors. So uh, there is potential for them to use Awara and reversing the term into something which is very valorizing. I'm Awara because I have to rely on myself to uh, give meaning to my life. Uh, so so that, that, that's, that's uh, uh, extremely interesting, I think. And uh, uh, I, I, when I was in Kabul last time, a long time ago, unfortunately, uh, it was still the time of the Internet Cafe. I love to spend time in Internet Cafe because I, I love to, to look at how people were seducing each other. And, you know, girls and boys uh, trying to text message and to just uh, a little caress in a context where that was highly subversive. That was a real reinvention of what it means to, uh, to build society. And I was going to music concert in the, in the, in the National uh, Music School and I could see you know, uh, girls and boys uh, touching uh, themselves. So they were somehow Awara who were reinventing what it means to be together in a very brave way because it's uh, in a context which that's not easy. So, uh, so um, Awara has probably some context, uh, some, some potential. You have a huge vocabulary in Persian. For instance, trust. There is a, a wonderful vocabulary to express different levels of trusts that I, I would like to explore too. And uh, uh, the, the, even for friendship, friendship, you have a huge vocabulary, very subtle. Uh, so you have all a way of uh, organizing and marking, making public the relationship which is extremely sophisticated mm -hmm. and uh, extremely uh, quickly changing also. Mm -hmm. I guess in the 70s, Rafik was camarade, so that was a communist term. And uh, probably it's not the case anymore and you have different ways how words are evolving. And I think Hawara, uh, is evolving quickly. Uh, there is the big singer of the 70s, uh, Ahmad Zahir. He has a fa famous, famous uh, crony. Uh, he has a song on Hawara. I'm feeling like a Hawara. But here, Hawara is because his beloved left him. Yeah. So, but on the other hand, that is with Ahmad. That's, I, I'm not so sure that it is. Um, it also, in those writings also, re they refer it as identity also. That it is not only in terms of that the action, that in terms of kind of becoming and that. So, I mean, they might be ch changing it, valorizing it, but as uh, as they are in those Facebook and those correspondence, some of them refer as identity actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they do, one. they do. Okay, I think. Uh, are there any questions then? Ahmad. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for the great uh, presentation. Uh, I'm online from Kobo. Uh, do you hear my voice? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, may I kind of ask you, during your research, what were your findings? Because, you know, the, during the decades, billions of dollars were pumped to the country, but it's not. In fact, people died. The people died in our food as it was expected. I don't understand. So, any findings on this? Uh, I'm sorry, but we, I could not he understand. You have to repeat the question. I'm sorry, the sound was. Or maybe you can translate. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm trying to listen better, but tell me. Uh, as, as I understand, you did. Uh, ground research in the country, right? Yes. And may I know the, what are the findings that you had during your research regarding the pumping of billion dollars from the community to the country, but it did not impact people life. People life did not pay. In the same time, the sustainability, for example, as of today, we, we have armed conflicts on the 24 provinces. 
with so many uh, victims uh, for the military and for the several years. Uh, this is my first question. I don't understand. Okay. I don't my understand. My second question is regarding the people who live politically. Uh, it's not only economical uh, issues and challenges because you know people they have lot uh, like millions of dollars but they prefer to leave the country and go to Europe or some somewhere where it has to life. For example, as you said, going from the uh, cooking uh, with water uh, illegally, so they know they have children, they have women, they have they themselves, and some of them they have issues. We have many stories. Uh, I'm sorry, it was not easy to understand you due to the connection, but uh, the, the second point, I fully agree with you, uh, uh, indeed, so I think it's multi, that's why I never focus so much about, uh, on, on motivations, because motivations are always multiple, and even a single person can, can live because uh, his or her life is threatened, but also because he or she wants to open up new horizon. So I think it's always about multiple motivations, and I always prefer to look at uh, the concrete strategies and tactics people have uh, developed to uh, solve the problems they are facing. Motivation, I think it's a black box somehow, uh, and it's always li linked to a model of the, 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 the social actor that probably I don't uh, subscribe, that you are making calculations in order to know what's the best uh, action. So I, I fully agree. I think the youth today, they are living for uh, a multitude of, of reasons. And it's, it's futile somehow even, I think, to trying to sort it out. The first question, I think, what's my finding? Uh, uh, here it was difficult to understand your voice. But uh, for the reconstruction, for the, the conflict going on, so I, would, uh, I don't know if it's uh, the answer you were expecting, but I would say two things. First, uh, when I was doing my past research, I was very interested in remittances, how are So uh, how people are remitting money back home and in a way which is very diluted over the territory. And I was saying that how is not only a way to send home to your dear ones left in Afghanistan, but it's also a way to organize diversity, a diverse, a special diversification and geographical uh, uh, people somehow, you know, through the Hawala system, the remittance system, made benefit of being dispersed and spread out in different countries. And that was something we should have uh, conceived and integrated into uh, pragmatical, I would say, solution for the reconstruction of the country. And I remember when I was saying these kind of things to UN guy, but also to uh, the Deputy Minister of uh, Migration, Afghanistan, he was saying, no, people have to vote with their feet. If they believe in the reconstruction process, they have to come back. Uh, and I was telling uh, him, uh, but don't you think you can be a very good citizen of Afghanistan while being abroad and taking care of your dear ones? And you can be, uh, in a kind of very transnational perspective, be a citizen of different societies at the same time and be an active supporter of the reconstruction process in Afghanistan without being in Afghanistan. That, that's, that's the first element of answer, I don't know. The second one, I would say, uh, uh, related to conflict in Afghanistan, what I, I was surprised when I, I, I think about my stay in New York or in other cities in the West, and looking at how Afghans from different regions, different uh, origin, interact little. Uh, so it's uh, even in Vienna now, that I'm in Vienna, I can see you, people from the north and the center and the south and the west and the east, uh, they have their own network of social life and uh, living in diaspora, to, to call it like that, is not a cradle for national unity, I'm afraid. Uh, and especially not in the US, where you have an incentive to become very visible, mm -hmm. to somehow capture mm -hmm. the US policy in Afghanistan. And I think sometimes it's even fueling uh, conflict. In Afghanistan, obviously, you have a lot of conflict. But uh, my point, and I don't know if you uh, would agree as an Afghan, is that you have always an ally among your enemies. 
So, uh, for instance, uh, I met once uh, three brothers. They had uh, three factions in their valley, and they explicitly decided to have one brother in each faction, <laughs> saying that in any case they will, be, they will have a winner among the brothers. And I think that's a very profound uh, way, Afghan way of, make, of doing politics, uh, which makes it uh, you know, difficult to make peace somehow, but difficult to make total war. Mm. And, uh, and uh, I had the feeling that in Afghanistan, in spite of, the, of 40 years now of war, massacres and a mm. huge amount of suffering, there is always a way, you, have, you know always people against whom you are fighting. You have always some bridges somehow, and that's something I have less seen somehow in Western cities. So I don't think Western cities to be confronted to democracy is such a, a vector of peace, of bringing peace in the country of origin. I think it's much more complex, let's say like that. I, I think we have to, thanks a lot, uh, Alessandro, but I think we have to uh, finish. We are already over uh, time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, questions. And thanks a lot again. Thank you. Well, thank you.